Sorry for the technical delay. I'd like to introduce Dr. David Lauer now, uh, who's an endos and throat specialist, uh, works a lot with dentists, one of the first endos and throat doctors actually to come and start educating dentists on uh, uh, the relationship of mouth breathing and facial growth uh, and poor sleep, etc. etc. Um, David is an associate professor at New South Wales University. He's involved in the teaching of the uh, upcoming endos and throat doctors. Uh, he's done a pediatric fellowship somewhere in the States. Uh, yeah, in Boston. In Boston. Um, Harvard. Yeah, yeah. the Children's Hospital. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, and so he has the whole gauntlet of adults and children. Uh, and he's in private practice in uh, Bondi Junction. I've been working with David for 20 something years, years at so least. You know? And uh, patients always very happy. And he's one of those guys that kind of just gets the job done. You know, I was sick of dealing with the nurse and throat doctors that kept saying, she'll be right, um, you'll grow out of this problem in like what I call a lot of doctor do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, David's the guy, when someone's clearly obstructing, you just want it sorted, David does it. So I'll hand over to you, David. Thank you very much. Thanks for introduction. Great, so, um, I'll, so I'll keep on with the talk and then we'll just have to answer any questions or if you have any patients that you, you might be dealing with that you think of you want to uh, talk about, no problems at all. So I'll keep this relatively short and then we can sort of talk about case, case examples of what we're talking about. So let's hit. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to do it? Do you want me to no, push it up? Okay. Go for it. Hit, hit the button. Yeah. Uh, so, relationship between ENT and dental concerns. So, these are the dental concerns that you would think would lead to um, considerations regarding ENT problems. So, Patients that have, um, so kids or adults um, with dental erosion, um, things that might suggest chronic mouth breathing, um, dental crowding, um, bruxism suggesting a sleep anomaly. So, with bruxism, certainly one of the causes of bruxism is obstruction. So, that can be a, certainly a close association. Uh, halitosis from nasal obstruction, mouth breathing, or just difficulty when wearing the appliance that you, um, that you fit. So if there's difficulty actually wearing their appliance, it might be because they can't breathe at night. So that's a very common occurrence. And that's in children, but also in adults. So adults who have difficulty wearing their mandibular advancement sleeve, often it's because their nose is blocked. And if you can unblock their nose, then they can wear their strength really well. So there's some of the common correlation concerns between ENT and dental. Ding. Thanks. Um, so, from an ENT dental speech therapy point of view, the main thing we should, things we should talk about are airway obstruction. So, that's sleep disorder breathing, which can go from just worker breathing and sleep, mouth breathing, snoring to sleep apnea. Um, speech and swallowing issues related to obstruction. Um, dentofacial growth anomalies, which of course are important in kids. Uh, bruxism, and halitosis, and TMJ concerns. And I often see, I see so many patients that come to see me with ear problems, which are TMJ and jaw problems. It's, it's, I, I think it, it balances the number of actual ear problems versus TMJ problems. So um, there's a co very close correlation between us all. So I think it's really important to have a team approach. And I think it's important that as ENT surgeons, we recognize speech, um, palate, dental, dentofacial anomalies. I think it's also important that the, that the dentist or not just recognise the anti-obstructive anomalies. And I know the speech therapists, we work very closely on the speech therapists in that regard as well. So I think having a team approach is really important. To look, to determine the actual presence of airway pathology, and that's not really that hard to see with, with the right equipment and, and gear and techniques. Um, and then to treat it appropriately, whether that's uh, medically, surgically, devices or other. Um, and to treat their dental orthodontic factors in correlation. So it's no good for me having a kid who's got really big tonsils and a really high arch narrow maxilla and a lot of dental crowding and I'm like, okay, right, we'll take out the tonsils and adenoids. And then their nose is still blocked because the floor of their nose is, is narrow because their maxilla is like this. You've got to expand that palate too. So you've got to treat both factors as well. Um, different patient factors, whether that's uh, like a craniofacial anomaly or something uh, specific to that patient, a congenital issue, and um, I think that a close approach gives the best income. Right, so we'll just look at a couple of patients. We'll look at a child and adult patient. Yeah. 
Great. So let's look at this three-year-old. See the three-year-old boy. What I love is when parents come with videos of their kids um, sleeping like this. So it's great when they come in and, and, and they start to be able to sleep and say, you know what, here's a video of my child sleeping. And that's just so helpful. And what I really love is doing the before and afters when they come with the before, which is kind of head back, mouth open, snoring, labored breathing, obstructed, wiggly, sweaty, um, tired during the day. And then you see them afterwards when they're just sleeping uh, beautifully. So here's a child who was a three-year-old boy who went to see who went to have his first dental checkup, um, and who's noted to have a high arch narrow palate, um, crap dental crowding, the story of bruxism, his parents would hear him crunching during the night, and that came up in the discussion then of obstruction, snoring, poor airflow. So it's amazing how many kids can go under the radar with these sorts of concerns, and they'll see their pediatrician or the family doctor who are who great, but they might not raise this because it hasn't been brought up as an issue, and it's first identified by their dentist or their dentist. So kids with sleep disorder breathing can develop dentofacial anomalies. Um, they can brux, they can have um, speech and swallowing issues from uh, obstructive, obstructive issues, certainly behavioral problems. So at the moment, as you've seen just in the last month, obviously there's been a lot of parent-teacher interviews for um, year, kindergarten and year one, year two kids, because I'm seeing this big influx of kids brought in by their parents for a hearing test and a discussion regarding breathing problems because their teacher was raised the little Johnny's a bit tired in class or not cooperating or not, not learning or I say go sit on the mat and he goes sits on his chair. So there's, obviously there's a bit of that going on at the moment. So um, developmental, sort of academic learning issues could be a really big part of um, obstruction. From a dental facial growth perspective, um, we know that if you mouth breathe, then your pterygoid muscles pull down in your maxilla. So you know, instead of having a nice uh, flat palate and a high narrow maxilla, which then leads to the secondary concerns. So that's what I call an adenoid face. So when a child walks into my office uh, with, a, with looking like that, you just you just know that they're going to be obstructed. Either they'll have really allergic turbinates, really deviated septum, really big adenoids, or a combination of all of the above. Um, even without looking at them, you can, you can tell. And then when you do the investigations, you can certainly see. Them. So when should you be concerned? So that's a common question because lots of kids, everyone has adenoids, unless we've removed them. Um, everyone's got a septum and turbinates, everyone breathes in different ways, and some breathe a little noisily and some don't, and some snore and some don't, but when would I be concerned? So certainly I'd be concerned if you identified a, a dentofacial change like a high arch narrow maxilla, um, dryness, gingival hypertrophy, all the things that go on with mouth breathing. If a child tends to have eating and breathing difficulties, so as a slow, picky eater, most typically with like big solid food, so actually obstructive eating issues. Um, certainly chronic snoring. So when my kids run well, when they had a kidney-related cold or something like that when they were little, um, they would snore. But then as long as that got better and went away, when they were better. But if it's somebody who snores or obstructs when well, that's the concern because that suggests a fixed obstruction, not just from swelling. Um, certainly any pause and gasping choking episodes is a concern in children. Now, a uh, proviso of that is that kids don't necessarily snore like adults, so they don't have to have really big, heavy snoring obstruction. They can just have quite a uh, light, like a, like a high-pitched sort of breathing in kids because they don't have the big palate to vibrate like adults do. So when I say snoring, I mean noisy breathing at night, not just the snoring that we're all used to from our partners when they've had a few too many drinks lying on the back. Um, Daytime tiredness is a big call, um, and recurrent ENT infections and, and other things like enuresis or being that go, can go along with obstruction, as well as just being grumpy and tired or hyperactive during the day. Uh, let's look at adults for a second. So, yeah, just keep pushing that. Then you'll just, you'll just scroll down. So, there's an adult. Yeah, just keep, keep going. Right. right. So, he's more somebody who's presenting with halitosis, bruxism, and um, dental cosmetic concerns. And going to his history, that his wife has to go to the other room because she can't stand his snoring anymore. Um, he drinks a bit too much, he's a, and he's a bit overweight. So what about for adults? So for adults, they can have concerns, which then can go to things like jaw and teeth problems um, from their obstruction, um, halitosis, dental decay, poor quality sleep, uh, which can then lead to work, driving, and um, uh, relationship problems. And if it gets severe enough, if they're really, really obstructive, of course, you can get into cardiac issues from sleep apnea. So when I talk about obstruction, I think a really good way for dentists or the non-speech therapists and ENT surgeons to think about obstruction is to talk about five levels of the airway. And there's a way I describe it to patients as well. 
So we talk about these five levels that I've indicated here. So the first level is the front of the nose, the anterior nose. So that includes your septum and your turbinates and sinus drainage areas and polyps and things like that. The second level is the back of the nose, which can, is the sort of the adenoidal area. The third is the back of the throat, so that's looking at your tonsil and palate area. The fourth is the tongue base, which is really important from a dental and orthodontic point of view, as you all know. And the fifth is looking more down at the larynx area. So whenever I see a patient, that's what I, I think about those five levels of the airway, and, and I look at those individually, and that's the way that I analyse a patient to see what we can do to help them. Yep. So let's talk about some common causes. So when you're examining your patient, you've all got bright lights or headlights, a lot of you. So look up a patient's nose, use your thumb, push their nose up, have a look at their septum. So when you push the front of their nose up, does the sept do you see the septum jutting out one side? Or if you look inside their nose, do you see a deviation like the one on the top, where it's just blocking one side of their nose? Do you see large turbinates, which look purpley, boggy and swollen just inside the side of the nose? I'll show you a photo of those shortly. Um, Adenoids is harder to see, you need a telescope for those. Um, polyps as well, you need to look at that um, with more sinus concerns. Um, so you can certainly have a good look at things with your, just with your headlight and the dental check. Yeah. Um, other causes of airway obstruction, uh, and other things like uh, tonsils obviously, uh, long palate, narrow tongue base area, um, lingual tonsils, which is the third set of tonsils in the back of the tongue, uh, and then problems with their epiglottis or larynx, which tends to be more of a concern in little kids with congenital problems. So when I assess an airway, I talk about symptoms examination and then the ENT, exam, ENT assessment. So you guys can ask about the symptoms. You can ask about mouth breathing, snoring, blocked nose, eating difficulties. You can ask about all those things when you do your assessment. You can examine the front of their nose. You can examine their oropharynx with all of the gear that you have. The ENT assessment, that's looking more things like at the back of the nose and looking down at the tongue base here in the larynx. Uh, and then there are investigations we can do as well, which you can order as well. So I have an outside-in approach. I start at the outside and work my way deeper in, and I compare the two sides. And as I said, you can use your thumb, you can use an otoscope to look in, you can use a metal device underneath the nose, like a metal tongue depressing with airflow. Um, all simple stuff that you have in your dental chair or a dental room. Um, you can listen to their voice and listen to their airflow. Do they sound when they breathe through their nose? Is it smooth or do they sound obstructed? Right? Um, listen to the quality of the voice. Do I, does the, there's a restriction also like this because your nose is really blocked up. Um, you can feel over their nose and sinuses for de deformity. So they're all simple things that you can do while the patient's sitting in your dental chair. What are some of the other signs we look at? So things like an allergic crease on the nose. So next time you're examining your six or seven year old, have a look at their nose. Do they have a white line or a dot of pimples or a line across their nose? That's an allergic crease. You look at that, you see the dark allergic shines under their eyes and immediately you don't need, you don't need to be an immunologist to know they've got allergic problems. Um, so put that together with blocked, swollen, pale body turbinate, which you can see just by looking inside the nose, and there's a very allergic child, allergic adult. Uh, with the tonsils, so normally you grade tonsils out of four. So one is small, two is coming to the tonsil pillar, three is coming just outside the tonsil pillar, and then four are more like these, which are almost touching the middle. So that's a grading system that we tend to use for tonsils, and it, it's simple to do. So. So one, two, three, four. And so that's really helpful in, in describing uh, tonsils and obstruction. Uh, with adenoids, this is a telescopic uh, photograph of adenoids, not a great one, but that's adenoids there blocking the back of the nose. So usually describe that in terms of percentage. So if I'm relating to um, a dentist or who's referring a patient, I'll talk about a grade of tonsils and I'll talk about percentage of structure on the back of the nose. So that one's blocking about, I'd say about 75% of the back of the nasal passage. So this should all be open, and that's that's the 25% they're reading through. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> um, so when I assess, I use an otoscope, I use, a t use telescopes to look at the airway. Yep, and there are telescopes, you can, there's no child that's too young to scope. So um, I see, uh, today I saw a four-week-old to get into the nasoscopy, so there are telescopes you've put into a four-week-old's nose. So certainly no one's too, too young to have a proper airway assessment. Um, so, uh, so that you should never be worried about looking at a child's airway or an adult and talking about their assessment. Um, I just want to talk about um, imaging now. So CVCT, so whether you use dental, who, who has a CVCT in their room? So kind of CT. Yeah, so a few. So it's a really useful thing if you want to look at airways as well. So you can look at... Um, you can do a cross through, you can do um, 
a, a coronal view, you could do um, a sagittal view, and you can have a look and see what's going on with the airway as well. So you look at the back of the nose, the palate, the distance between the palate, the adenoids in the back of the palate, um, and then you can look at their septum and their turbinates and their sinuses. So they're really useful imaging to have. If you don't have those and you're doing dental x-rays anyway, you can catch the bottom of the, um, the sinuses with your x-ray, you can often catch the septum and the turbinates as well. Um, or if you send them off for an airways x-ray, then don't forget the lateral airways x-ray which shows the lateral part which is the adenoids and the, and the palate and the tongue base. So Derek's, obviously with Derek's port failure, it's really useful. So any one of his patients comes along, they've got all those x-rays already there. So it's all, all done, it's already really measured out, so that's really useful. So these are some CBCT uh, views here. So here you can look at the coronal section, you see the septum, the turbinates, the sinuses. And here in the um, coronal view, you can see the tongue base, how narrow this patient is in the tongue base here. And this is their axial view again, you can see the tongue base. So imaging can be really useful when it comes to their weight concerns. Uh, okay, and so this is just again showing some views. This is an axial view, so we're looking up from below the patient here. And we're just looking at the septum here, the sinuses, the turbinates coming up here, and then looking further in sinuses. So when you're doing, if you're doing your views, if you've got the machine and using it, then have a look at the nose and have a look at the sinuses as well. Yeah. And then the sagittal view shots, which are useful. Yeah, so here we look, this is a shift. This could be a lateral as x-ray or as this is a kind of CT. But look at the size of the adenoids here, block the back of the nose. So this kid's just breathing through this little space here instead of that whole space there. So the adenoids are just huge block in the back of the nose. So imaging can be very helpful in, in this regard. Yep, and tongue base is set. So for you guys, tongue base, um, when you're doing medieval advanced splinting, um, I can have a look down and I can look at the tongue base and I can see how it improves when they push their jaw forward. But if you've got the imaging as well, it can be quite useful to have a look at the, the tongue base area as well. Right. Um, in your coronal um, views in imaging, um, you can look at the, so this is a patient looking back out at us. So this is their right eye, left eye, brain up there, nose and sinuses down here. So this is the septal deviation here. Um, this patient's had their turbinates removed, so they don't have any turbinates, which is not great to remove turbinates like that, but this patient's had their turbinates removed. And they've got blocked up sinus drainage pathways, so poorer grayness in their sinuses. And all these sinuses are all black, there's no grain. Yep, and here's another one. So just again showing septal deviation, turbinate hypertrophy. So you can see why this adult will have a blocked up nose. And also you can see this wants to show their sinuses. Nice black healthy sinus, a blocked up and a pacified sinus on that one. So there's a patient with evident sinuses. So you wouldn't want to be putting an implant or anything into that sinus until it's clear. Right. Um, this is just comparing imaging to um, true reality. So here we've got the deviated septum. You can see the deviated septum coming across here. And the big turbinate, you can see the big turbinate over here. So um, yeah, just useful when you're doing those, those um, that imaging. Okay. And our allergy patient, remember our allergic crease? So this is a very allergic nose here. So you can see the, there's all this gray, thicker lining in the sinuses and all the thicker lining here, the turbinates a bit swollen. So very much an allergic sort of picture on that scan. And the septal deviation, septal deviation like that, really blocking the left side of the nose. And here's that septal deviation here, blocking the left side of the nose. So actually dividing the nose into two passages. So there's no way that patient can breathe properly through their nose. Yep, and a big turbinate. So just for your interest, this is, this is here. You can see on this, this is from a scan, CT set by dentist. This is um, a huge turbinate here compared to this one. So this is called a concobulosa or an air-filled little turbinate. So that blocks up the right side of the nose. This is the tur big air-filled turbinate here. So that means this patient, you can see how this patient can't breathe through the side of the nose because they have this extra sinus filling up the turbinate there. Uh, and again, turbinate hypertrophy and septal deviation. Right, and one, that's just another one here showing. This is called silent sinus syndrome. So this is a really interesting one. So if you're looking at this scan, this is the, the wall of the sinus here, and this is the sinus cavity here, and this is the, the orbit right the eye here. And on this side, the wall, instead of being straight like that, you can see how it's curved in like this, and how this sinus is so much smaller than this sinus. And if you look at the floor of the eye, the orbital floor, that one's concave like that, whereas this one is convex like that. 
So this is called a silent sinus syndrome. So often this is picked up on dental imaging like home maybe CT scans. So this patient has no symptoms whatsoever, right? nothing at all. But what's happening is that the sinus opening has been blocked and the sinus fills the mucus and actually contracts and it squeezes down and it pulls the side wall in. And the problem with this is it actually pulls the orbital floor down. So eventually that patient's eye will drop into their sinus and they get double vision. So if you ever see a one-sided opacified sinus like this, then that's, you want to get that seen to We always operate on these, always open up this area to stop the eye being sucked down. Uh, this is a really big polyp on this one. So this, this side's really blocked up here. This is a big polyp filling up the nasal passage on that side. Yeah. And that's a polyp sitting, a sort of cyst in the sinus. So this is the maxillary sinus here. You can see with that big lump there. And that's a mucus cyst, which we often, again, pick up on our dental scans. Uh, and this is just showing that patient with the silent sinus and how their eyes drop down into the sinus on the right side. And this uh, last one is a tumour. So, this is a, so you can get tumours in the nose. So this is a, what's called an angiofibroma, which is a tumour that occurs only in men, only in males get this tumour, and it's a vascular tumour. So this patient presented with nasal obstruction and bleeding noses, and this was the, the tumour that they had in the back of their nose. So back to our case report. So yep, yeah, this next one. Next slide. Yep, thank you. So um, when you assess these patients, um, you're looking at a history of examination, you're looking at their airway symptoms, you do some imaging, um, you get their orthodontic and dental opinion, you may need a speech opinion as well depending on their concern. Um, when it comes to sleep studies, Derek mentioned, so when do I use a sleep study is a common question. So you should say if it, if it cracks like a duck and um, looks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So, if someone has obvious obstructive symptoms and they've got obviously obstructive features, then usually you don't bother doing putting a child, especially to a sleep study. So I'll use a sleep study in a child if I think they're very severe. So in the less than twos, if I'm quite concerned just from an anaesthetic, pre-anaesthetic, um, to get a pre-aesthetic opinion, um, or if things don't match. So if I get a history from a child who sounds really obstructive, but I look at their airway and their airway is not bad, then I want a sleep study to see what's going on, and vice versa. If I see a child who's got huge tonsils and adenoids, but they don't have history obstruction, then I'm again suspicious, so then I'll get a sleep study done. So it's in those fringe elements where in kids I tend to get a sleep study. In adults, I'll usually recommend a sleep study as part of their treatment protocol. So the way that it usually works is that if I see an adult who's got a really, say, deviated septum or polyps or something like that, I'll fix that first surgically, and then do a sleep study, and then until the jaw sort of issues sorted out, because it's often you know, tongue based, you know, the most common cause of snoring. So, I think in that stepwise approach, you get the airway as good as you can, and then you get a sleep study and deal with it. Because I know that Derek won't do a um, medical sleep without a sleep study uh, because it's not safe, because you don't want to make a silent apnea. In other words, you don't want to stop their snoring and have them obstruct and die. So you need to do a sleep study before and then usually a sleep study afterwards to make sure that you've actually fixed the sleep apnea, not just the snoring. So first thing I do is treat nasal obstruction. Yep, that's all good. So treat the allergy, treat, treat the pulse, treat the septum. Secondly, treat the post-nasal space, so get that nice and clear. Yep. Then I'll treat the oropharyngeal area. So basically stepping down those five, those five levels, so the big tonsils, you know, whatever's obstructing their airway. And then four, look at the tongue base. And you then. You also mentioned the high lung cavity. Yes. Is that an anatomical anomaly? Yeah, for some people, they have the malpatty classification, so the degree that the palate hangs down. So 20 years ago, when, well, when I was just starting 25 years ago, um, palate lasering was really popular. You laser the back of the, everyone who snored got their palate lasered. But it didn't work. And why didn't it work? Because usually it wasn't the level of obstruction. So they had a really sore palate, they felt like there was, there was a hair in the back of their throat for the rest of their life and it didn't stop them snoring because the snoring was probably coming from their tongue base. And so it's only done in very select circumstances now. So a lot of snoring is nasal and tongue base, very little is actually due to a palate problem. Yep, next slide. Great, and then treat larynx and bolus. So little babies, just so you're not going to be seeing these so much, but little babies who have snoring sleep apnea, often will ring their which is here, so that's when the epiglottis is all folded in and the airway is really tight. So I, I treat a lot of these because I'm at Sydney Children's Hospital, we treat a lot of these kids. Um, some people sometimes can have a laryngeal tumour. 
So that's a laryngeal tumor blocking the airway in the child, and that was a neurofibroma. So sometimes you can get obstructive issues down in the, in the lower part as well. That's, that's usually a little bit more um, critical if that's happening. Oh, thank you. So what's news as far as um, the most common thing we do to treat with sleep apnea in kids or snoring is tonsils and or adenoids. Um, so age-wise, so now we, we, this procedure you do quite young now with more modern surgical techniques. So the youngest adenoids that I have done is three months old. Um, but certainly plenty of five-month-old, nine-month-old, ten-month-old, one-year-olds, it's very common. Um, tonsils, the youngest are only six months old for obstruction. So you would never do that for infection, but for obstruction. And that's because you can modify your technique and make it bloodless and, and monitor them carefully. So usually the technique now it's less, less uh, bleeding. Uh, we monitor them more carefully afterwards, we observe them closely, we avoid certain analgesics now, and sometimes we need pre-op CPAP if they're really obstructed. So we've got all those facilities now where we can do the younger, younger kids and more critical kids. Uh, for adults, what do we do for them? So firstly, I would always consider the symptoms of clinical findings. I would consider a sleep study depending on what order we're going to do things in. So I said I'll often correct the septal deviation, fix the turbines, fix the polyps, Making them get them to lose some weight. Um, and then, then, if there's ongoing concerns, then you're going to do a sleep study, look at just splint options, um, and obviously CPAP might come into that as well. So, in ET generally, so we tend to be a bit more selective these days. So we tend to keep things a bit more contained, more conservative, but more specific without and precise with our surgery. Um, new techniques with shavers, cobladers, lasers, all things we use now to try to do the operations a little less um, post-operative recovery. Um, and I think it's more recognised now over the last 20 years, certainly, that Derek and I have been doing this stuff for interested in Derek as the flag waiver of, of that of dentofacial um, obstructive issues, um, to have that cooperative approach. And I think if you can be minimally invasive and get the best outcome for the patient from a breathing and facial growth point of view, they'll have the best, best outcome. So in summary, team approach is good. In your dental practices, please look and ask about the airway. No patient has, will ever criticise you for asking about airway concerns. If parents love it. They go, wow, why didn't anyone else ask me about this? I see that multiple times a day. Why did my dentist, why is my dentist the one who picked up my child's snoring obstruction? So go for it. Um, and then cooperate, you know, do it backwards and forwards as a cooperative approach. Right, and that is my talk. So, um, uh, questions? Any cases anyone wants to discuss? Anyone got an interesting kid or adult? Yes? Uh, so we're allergic to bromides or turbulence. Yes, turbulence. Uh, if you do remove them, what's the treatment of them coming back? Okay, so you never want to remove turbulence. So, turbulence, so adenoids you can remove, tonsils you can remove, turbulence you don't remove. So if you, the French used to love removing turbulence and all you get is a really dry nose, and lifelong nasal crustiness and obstruction. But you can reduce turbulence. So in kids and adults, we do different types of turbulent reductions. So in a child, I'll do a child turbulent reduction, which is called a curvelator reduction. So a curvelator is an instrument looks like a looks like a pencil lead, I suppose, like the middle of a pencil. And it's got a current that goes through it with bipolar electricity at the end. So it goes, so when you do this procedure, it's done as a day surgery. You put it inside the turbinate, and it basically cooks the inside tissue of the turbinate. So the turbinate has bone, what's called rectal tissue, and then the lining of the turbinate. And it's that swollen rectal tissue that causes the problem. So the cablator goes in, and it shrivels down by basically microwaving or burning the rectal tissue inside the turbinate, and the turbinate shrivels down. So it does, you don't remove the bone, you don't take out the lining. It's done as a day surgery. It's very little bit of but morbidity and very little pain or anything like that. And that just gives them more room. But if you do that alone, the, and they have to be really allergic, the lining will just start swelling again, and the problem will come back. So we'll talk about that. With adults, when you do a turbo reduction, it's fine, you do it done differently. So with an adult, you actually lift up the lining, you take out the bone and take physically shave out some of the rectal tissue, and then you put the lining back so it physically makes it smaller. So it's a much more aggressive, it's not aggressive, but it's a more involved surgery. Still not very painful, still a day surgery thing, usually unless it's done with septum type of things. Um, but it's more physical reduction. So if you don't manage the allergy side, the nasal lining will become swollen. So I always talk to patients about a two-pronged approach, which is one, breathe better by relieving the obstruction, two, manage the allergy side. 
So usually if I do a turbulent reduction procedure, I will at the same time while they're asleep do an allergy test. And then afterwards we go, right, how's your breathing? Fantastic. Right, now let's see what you're allergic to. Uh, dust, my grass pollen, milk, whatever. Let's talk about managing the allergies. So that might be allergen avoidance, or it might be true medical treatment, or I might involve a colleague immunologist like I would involve a colleague immunologist. So managing the allergy side is really important. So does that answer your question? Because my son's got a question. Okay. Um, and we haven't, we haven't done the mm -hmm. It's not that clinical. Because you can it's concerned that it'll just come back. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, How old is he? 11. 11, yeah. So at 11, you're still a little bit halfway between the adult and kid ones. So it depends how big an 11 year old he is. So sometimes the 11 year olds will do sort of like a halfway procedure where you'll take some of the, a little bit of the bone out, but not do too much. They so just do a clinical more conservative procedure, a bit more of the um, the tissue. Um, so do a bit more than you do with, say, a five or six year old, but not what you would do for an adult. But if, if I was going to do that procedure to an 11 year old, I would, if he hasn't had an allergy test, I would definitely do one while he's asleep. And um, then you talk about allergy management afterwards. That gives you the best outcome. He's got, he's got allergy to um, dust metal. Sure, the two common ones. So then it looks at avoidance measures, medical measures, or uh, immunotherapy measures. Yeah. So you've got to still treat the allergy. So you never said to a patient do a septoplasty or tumor reduction and cure an allergy. You've got to manage the allergy side as well. But if he's obstructed, what are you going to do? Leave him on nasal spray forever? That's not a great option. Well, he's got a CPAP. CPAP? Wow, okay. That's not common in 11 year olds. Yeah, so. We've managed to get him on. Right, yeah. 11 year olds quite probably use a CPAP. So, yeah, I mean, that's the sort of child where you want to make the airway as good as you possibly can. Um, I gather it's our tonsils and adenoids out. No, because we've, we've got it checked and they want to be. He's on CPAP. Well, well, that's an unusual combination. We should, well, we should have it be checked because I've had, I've had cases where it's been diagnosed by one and the not it's perfectly okay and then we sent to another. And I don't think that's Again, you might have been, I don't know if it's looking after, it might be awesome, but um, yeah, that just sounds a little unusual, a little unusual scenario. Um, so, uh, is, like you need to really look at 11 year olds, easy to scope, right? So, that's an easy age to do, much easier than a five year old. So, you know, you have a look really carefully at all those five areas of the airway. But if, if an 11 year old's on CPAP, there must be an issue in one or more of those five levels of the airway that's causing obstruction. And in 11, the CPAP is affecting the forward growth of the jaw. So, I haven't seen your kid, but my, my no hypothesis would be the maxilla probably needs widening and bringing forward. And or you know, some throat, but I can send you papers by the godfather of sleep, uh, Christian Gubino, who is very against CPAP in children, right? Because it affects facial growth, yeah. Yeah, so short term CPAP's okay, but long, like if they're really, yeah, it's got life in CPAP, yeah. mm -hmm. but that would be an unusual scenario, I'll put it that way, to be on yeah. CPAP, mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, I mean, if it's a choice between CPAP or turbo reduction, I'd go on turbo reduction. Uh, but it sounds like there's more going on there. Also depends, you know, sleep studies, where's it done, who's done it, what sort of sleep study. Like, you know, when you've done a lot of it, as, as we have certainly, you kind of know, you know, some people you get to sleep, everyone's got life and sleep apnea and others have nothing and you kind of, it's a balance. Yeah. But I hope that answers your question about turbulence. So they work, it works really well, but you've got to manage the allergies. We have put a um, nasal mucosa. Where does the actual uh, the, the three functions purification, humidification, and nitration mm -hmm. of their stuff? Is it right from the beginning or yep. further up? No, right from the beginning. And the turbinates have a big role, and that's why you don't remove turbinates. Why, you know, that's right. That's why you don't burn turbinates, right? Like, you don't, like in the old days, you used to either chop them out or cauterize the edge of the turbinate. Mm -hmm. That's created like a burnt tissue, burnt redundant mm -hmm. tissue, so you lost all of that. Stuff, yeah. so we just don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, that's very old fashioned. Mm -hmm. So, things like that photo I showed the scan I showed you that the person had the turbulence removed. Mm -hmm. I see that, like, oh, I like the shivers. I know that's a patient who's going to come and see me go, my nose is always blocked, and I have a dry, crusty nose all the time. There's nothing you can do about it, it's too late. Mm -hmm. So, you have to be quite conservative mm -hmm. with turbulence, mm -hmm. uh, particularly septums. You can straighten those all over the place, but turbulence, mm -hmm. you have to be gentle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, sorry. You always see the itchy 
he's probably he probably has that line that you were mentioning. Yeah. But is that a common thing that? Yeah, sure. That's part of his dust mite and grass pollinology. Has he seen the immunologist to manage the allergy part? Does he have any expansion? Sounds like he has. That's actually he has no crowding. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, we only just put him on the seat back when I the last year, the last half a year, just because yeah. we haven't, we're not ready to do the reduction yet, but I was concerned about the seat back and the other side of things. Yeah. yeah. How bad is the seat back there? Because I find it asking. What's his numbers? I think about five. Five an hour? Mm. And his sets? Or is it more situation saturations? So what two dollars? What about ninety three, ninety four? Probably around there. That doesn't sound that doesn't sound so bad to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, again it's hard to give an opinion from a distance, but mm -hmm. it would just be a sleep study resume, didn't you? I knew it just right. Jim's a good guy. Yeah, well Jim's a good guy. Yeah, it just sounds like the airway needs a bit of a look at that. I'm good. He knows his own valuation, second opinion. He's a blue form in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to look, I'm happy to look at you keep no charge. Oh, just because yeah. you know it's your own kid. Yeah. That's and right. uh, you're, yes. you're right. more the more people give you an opinion, the, the more you can make a decision. But see that is is a band-aid solution short term. Mm -hmm. It's not something a kid needs. Logan, yeah. you know, you know I mean? oh, we spent a lot of time on this. Okay, here's a question for people. How many of you know the correct function of the uvula? Why do we have a uvula? Come on, you're all dentists, you see a uvula every day. Come on, there's a prize here. You get a bottle of Jacob's Creek um, wine. Come on, roll the uvula. Do you agree with that? It's doing swallowing function. Five. Uh -huh. Now, come on, how many of you see a uvula every day? All of us. Right. What happens if it's a bifid uvula? Would you be worried? Or would you think? What happens if the uvula is really edematous and battered and red? Oh, this, is, this is questions and answers, I feel like on QA. Yeah. <laughs> yes or no? Come on, speech pathologists, you see, you see uvulas all the time. Yeah. So, why don't I want to know what's the, why do we have a uvula? Right. Number two, what sort of pathology would you see in a uvula that would alert you to blah blah blah? Is it like the size of the bowl of the so, food is solving? Well, bifidibulas are a concern because of the way the palate is developed in embryology. So the palate grows from two sides, joins together, and put the mold. So if you've got a bifidibula, we're the palate's weak. Yeah. And so then, from my and then as a direct point of view, I'm going to be concerned about hypernasal speech. So. Tell them when they think talk, when you get near a snack your nose, which mm -hmm. speech is like also identified, um, or when they drink, it might come out their nose if it's bad enough. So it might be what's called a sudden split palate, which is not a cleft palate, but it's a poor knitting of the muscles. Which, and from my point of view, if I have a kid who's got that and really the adenoids, I'm going to do a selective adenoidectomy where I don't take all the adenoids out because that's going to make news even worse. Um, so then you just remove some of the obstructive adenoids but leave the stuff down below. But um, the big thing, palate, you, if you take someone's uvula off, for say they've got papilloma on the uvula or, you, or something, you've got to remove it. The thing they always complain about is the feeling of mucus in the back of their throat. Yeah. So the, the uvula sort of wipes mucus off the back wall of your throat and helps stop that, stop that yeah. feeling. So it's like the windscreen yeah. wipe up on your cup. Yeah. My poor old dad, Friday you evening about sleep medicine, went off and had a neutral pee. Mm -hmm. And then they remove the uvula, right? Yeah. It's like knee palm in the morning. Uh, and the poor guy, every time he gets a head cold, he gets that post nasal drip. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's just nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Okay, what about a red edematous uh, uvula that's not bifid? What's that a sign of? Inflammation. Like specifically? Yeah. What do you think? Nasal inflammation. Mm. Yeah. So, I, well, I tend to see a lot of people who snore a lot. They exactly. get, they get Then the uvula gets, gets, gets traumatized. So. They get sucked down, so you see the uvula gets sucked down by their tongue basically, you know, and it sucks the uvula down. If you go to um, YouTube, punch up bifid uvula, there's a great video by me um, <laughs> that answers all those questions and shows cases. Please do that because you're dentist, you know. All right, here's another thing. What happens if you look at tonsils? I hope you all do. Yes, no, you know the grading. 
What happens if you see a unilaterally enlarged tonsil? In other words, this side is all good, but this side is so big it's almost to the midline of the uva, in the, under the uva. Big unilateral enlarged tonsil. <laughs> Diagnosis. Like a little Right now, all of you will be coming back for your post exam when the jacaranda tree flowers. <laughs> Which is like someone, someone that died. You know, yeah, the jacaranda yeah. tree in Sydney Union, yeah, the great quadrangle. Yeah. yeah, it's dead. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. That's for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I reckon it's some student poison that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Anyway, unilateral in the large tonsil. Um, lymphoma? Yeah, that's good. But what's the differential diagnosis of the tonsil? Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, yeah, so sometimes you can just have a large, large tonsil can be always, but always be chronically infected and just one bigger, but you always have to be worried about if you a CC or another tumour of the tonsil. So that's tumour is your number one concern. Yeah. Especially if it looks purpley and unusual and the lighting is unusual. Or are your patients a smoker? Yeah. You know, all this sort of thing. But yeah. or just, just like start tonsil. looking at tonsils. So, now, who can tell me the difference between looking at the size of the tonsil, right, mm -hmm. and a melon party score? Mm -hmm. Everyone heard of melon party? Mm -hmm. Melon party was a famous, uh, what do you call it? Anesthetist. Anesthetist. Yes. Um, who realised that when he put people to sleep, he could almost tell who had sleep apnea by the opening mm -hmm. of their oropharynx. In other words, you know, combination of the base of their tongue and tonsils, their soft palate, their uvula. You've heard of melon party index? So, mount, no? Google it. So, it, when, when someone's an, if you've ever had an anesthetic, many of you have an anesthetic, every time you have an anesthetic, the anesthetic has to record which are melon party graders. So, if you have ever had one, you can get those notes, you'll have a look on the anesthetic chart. It's always recorded. It's every case we do, it's part of the documentation of surgery, which is how narrow your orifice is in melon party. I'll pass around the melon party index. This is a good little diagram I show patients. So the question is, when you look at tonsils, right, look at them properly, you need to push the tongue down. In other words, you guys have the little uh, mouth mirror. What's it called? Number six? No. What do you call the little dental mouth mirror? Yeah. If you push that down, then you can do a Friedman classification for the tonsil, right? And grade four and three tonsils need further investigation. Now, Malin Party, it was on passing around here, you literally just get the patient say, ah, like that. Don't push anything out, just say, ah, and look at the back of the throat. I do that all the time, but I don't know the name. Now you do. Right. So, who, so Malin Party Index is good as a sign of picking up possible sleep apnea. Right. And so, what I'm saying is, as dentists and speech pathologists, we're looking at the mouth more than any other medical GP. Would you agree? Yeah. But the yeah. thing is, we're just trained to look at the bloody teeth and the gums. You go. There's such a bigger picture if you look at the back of the tongue and all these areas that they're deep right. You know, probably 80% of systemic problems manifest themselves in the mouth early when it comes to the big, big ones. Make sense? And also look forward to like lips, and like lips and gums and things, you know, dry and cracking point of view as well from mouth breathing. So not so going from the front all the way to the back. It's really important. Can I ask you a question? How long after the um, tonsil and adenoidectomy would you expect the voice to change yeah. naturally? Great question. So um, some kids are really obstructed when you take their tonsils and adenoids out, depending on the technique you use. Um, but if you say if you do a really big clearance, then their voice changes, they get a bit hypernasal, which is the thing I just got when I more for like they're really your nose a bit. Um, so it depends on the size of the tonsil. Also, it tends to say boys more than girls tend to have the effect, and the bigger tonsils are more the effect. Normally, it will just be within about three months overall. So if it goes past, I always, if I see that, I should always sort of say, well, look, it's still in three months, then you know, let's talk more about it. Um, but usually, when you do a tonsillectomy, you know, you just assess the palate carefully and adjust for that. But you, you can get some which are just more hypernasal than others. So, so I have a client at the moment who's just had it and he, I think he's six months post and he's still quite hypernasal, always with a runny nose. How old? He's four. Four, yeah, so runny nose. So it depends on, again, the technique used. So that, there's a shift in technique mode between curette adenoidectomy and diathermy adenoidectomy. So 
there's a different, I, I sort of juggle between the two depending on the patient and the adverts, but some people only do one, some people only do the other. But curette, you get a big clearance, but you have more risk of getting hypernasal. With the diathermy one, you don't get any bleeding, but you remove less adenoid tissue, but you often get more of the runny nose. Mm -hmm. So it is just which technique was used, um, which is where you go. And maybe the runny nose is a bit more rhinitis and that sort of stuff as well. But um, yeah, you can see voice change after that, that sort of three month period, especially in boys with huge tonsils. I mean, does change so, so boys, boys, so when you see boys out there who have really a grade four tonsils of adenoid stud, they always sound really squeaky afterwards. Um, so you see that, but they always sound impressed. Oh my God, my, you know, my four year old sounds so squeaky. And they do, right? Because they're adjusted to that more room and the palate difference. But usually, again, that will get better within the three months or so. So the bigger the boys and the bigger the tonsils, the more you get a voice effect. But usually, it's a rarely a permanent effect. If it is a, it is a more long-term effect, I'll also be sending to a speech pathologist to assess their palate, and then they have tests like video philosophy tests their palate function, that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. What is your age of the thorough Like, how do you guys work together? Yeah, sure, we do. Yeah, absolutely. So people like in the junction, people like Michelle Person, people like that. Yeah, absolutely. How do you look at that? Oh, uh, sometimes they'll they'll have seen it, her or someone like that, and then I'll see that and I'll send them, you know, we'll interact with, with dealing with whatever the airway issue is. Sometimes they're referred to me from people who are orofashionologists. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's gone through the dental route where they're doing sort of seeing everybody. I so think yeah, mainly interact. David, as in, you know, as a throat doctor, understands that if a kid's been a mouth for nine years and he improves the plumbing, they don't automatically revert to nasal breathing. That's where the neurologist comes in. You know, we, we teach yeah. our kids how to talk, we teach them how to walk. Sometimes you've got to teach them how to breathe through their nose again. Yeah. Uh, so that's a very important part. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, they're part of the, the mix in that team. And the posture as well. Mm -hmm. I asked them back to my other patient the course. Oh, great, excellent. To the speech, so I'm Super. Um, it, should, it, should, it should almost be compulsory as part of your yeah. speech, yeah. Um, what do you call it, undergraduate degree. You know what yeah. I mean? But something about speech so pathologists so. or the teachers of speech pathologists, yeah. they're always so worried about scope of practice. They go, mm -hmm. well, is it part of scope of practice? Yeah. It's, it's, it's like I'm a really voice weird. specialist, but I'm not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, 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 but it's, you'll see you get so much interaction with dentists. We are looking for people with that sort of training. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah. My other question is more personal. I've got a daughter who's six. She's had a transectomy, at most transectomy, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, she had the sleep apnea. That seems to resolve. She also has allergies. Mm -hmm. um, and just looking at some photos, she's no longer puffed under the eyes. That's, that looks like it's much clearer. But she has always sucked her tongue as a, a calming sort of mechanism. Mm -hmm. That kind of, she's not even aware of it. I asked her about it and she said, I'm not aware that I'm even doing that. Will that have an impact? I imagine that we have an impact on her palate. I've never actually looked at this. Yeah, If you're sucking your tongue, you're not putting it in the right position, that's for sure. How old is your daughter? Six. Six, yeah. So that's a time you really want to get the tongue up on the palate. So one of the first things you're learning, you know, who are you doing course with, Rochelle? The oral myology training? Um, Louisa and... Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the first things I'll teach you. Oral myology is all about lips together, breathe through your nose and tongue on the palate. Mm -hmm. You can't do oral myology unless the nose and throat <coughs> is clear the nasal airway. Make sense? Mm -hmm. You can't do oral myology properly if the palate's not the right width. But at six, you wouldn't even expand at that age. The tongue can still expand. And if she's doing something weird with the tongue, whatever it is, right? Um, the tongue's not doing its normal role. So you've got to break that habit and teach her how to put the tongue on the palate. You have these things called um, myo spots. I don't know if you've seen those. You put them on the palatine root bank. It's called a spot. And that's where the tongue should be sitting during the day. But at night, she might go back to the old habit. So we use things like myo munchies and myo braces. You know that? Yeah, is? her mouth is always closed at night. She sleeps yeah. with a closed posture. And even during the day, she never closed. But it's just a habit during the day. Sometimes she, when she's almost. Yeah. When she's more tired, almost, it's like a self-soothing right. technique. Almost choice. like like a pacifier yeah. type thing, yeah. 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 I think you've just got to work to break that habit, but do it like now because, yeah. Yeah, so I saw a, a two-year-old today who 
was obviously instructed. And interesting, I mean, she's always been around because she's been born. And she had this pallor that was like that, you know, two year old, and huge tonsils and adenoids and blue ear and the whole package. But you just, so I actually said to the mum, like, you know, we can make really the obstruction, but, you know, she's probably going to need orthodontics later on because her palate was, and her mum's palate as well, was so high arched. So, and to get her breathing properly in, I think she's going to need something in that regard. So, yeah, it's important early on to take care of it. I think we as speech pathologists have such a hard role because I see clients all the time and I'm like, you need to go to see a dentist or orthodontist and they just don't go or ENT. And I'm like, have you had your hearing checked yet? You're wasting your time. But they just feel like we're going to fix them and I'm constantly like, I can't help you unless you... Yeah, it's I, mean, I, I see a lot of patients from speech pathologists I mean, I, 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 uh, who have exactly that, right? So, you know, I yeah. think your hearing's dodgy and they come and we check their hearing and that sort of thing. Um, so it's funny that people are resistant to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It just makes it really hard. Like I've got a client who I've been seeing for a while and her palate is just, I think she saw you actually. And so like, oh, we're just going to wait. Mm-hmm. But I can't. Like, yeah. She's not like, it. And um, her teeth are everywhere and her palate is like. You know, the sad thing is quite a few dentists do say you wait until you yeah. Yeah, it's a bit late. Like, I know, and then that's it's so late. late. You know, you do get that quite often. So yeah. It's not just their fault, it's the advice they get from mm-hmm. them. The other professional that, that gets them out of that position. It, it, it's, it's amazing how still we have that with our profession. Well, over 20 years of education. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Any other yes, questions? So, uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, uh, you were just studying before uh, giving space to patients. Is that the case for every patient, like most patients? The mass, a medical mass split, or yeah, yeah, yeah. that is a mass split. I don't think you would. Yeah. So yeah. what I said before, I do a mandibular advancement split. I need to check the nasal airway is good because if they're obstructed here yeah. and I do this, it's not going to help that much, right? So David does two things for me. He nasal endoscopes to check this is okay, but he also gets the patient to bring their jaw forward while he's got his camera there. And I can be 100% guaranteed that the airway is open. Some people, it's amazing, you bring the jaw forward and the airway collapses, it gets worse. And most dentists don't understand that. They just think, oh, it's a cure-all. My patient still should just give him one of these. Yeah. Right? So, so do you understand what I'm saying? So, so if you want to be 100% sure that this is going to have any positive effect on the airway, get an ear, nose and throat doctor to measure the change in that, right? Because some people have a, a Airway that narrow, but they don't collapse. And the data from that sleep study is uploaded for a sleep physician to report. You get it? So you get a proper sleep report. And that's only for adults. If you're a child, you can't do a home sleep study. The child has to be hospital based. And that's the problem. The public waiting list for a hospital based children's sleep study is quite long. More than six months. Yeah. So, so that's where you need to work with people like Wilcock who can, you know, get the new one easier. But if you need any questions on who to work with for sleep studies, send me an email. Yeah. Um, Andrea, can you remind me, I promise all these doctors to send them Zaghi's um, videos, right? Can you, so just give me there. So I'll send you the link to Dr. Zaghi's videos on lip and tongue tie. What to look for, how to release it properly, and how oral mileage you work with. Fantastic. He's got an institute called the Breathe Institute. You people, that's your next level of um, of training. Yeah. It's it's, uh, you can see this here a lot. Yeah, that doesn't make him amazing. <laughs> she's she's yeah. the Iranian. You're Iranian too, aren't you? Of course, of course, yeah, he does. Yeah. I've been to Iran many times. Yeah, I know. Where children are told mm-hmm. you, either, you either become a doctor, a dentist, or engineer, or just don't come. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's the uh, Persian way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he is Persian. Yeah. And funny enough, he married another Persian. Does that surprise you? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of very good and Yeah. Where I, where I was working in yes. Boston as well, there were a number of... Um, West Coast, right? Every medical specialist is uh, Persian. Yeah. But this guy is dual qualified, max fac, he knows and throat, sleep position. All three degrees. How amazing is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I invited him here to speak. And he was great, great. Job. And very just willing to share, right? Yeah, yeah. But he's the real deal. And he's come up with the protocol that Stanford uses. 
So if Stanford State Medicine uses his protocol, do you think it's good? Yes. But, so I'll send you the link. It's got all his protocol and his videos and how to do things, and you'll see. This is common sense. Last question, anyone? Yes, no? Going once, going well, twice? Yes. yes. <laughs> Not about you, kid. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 we feel like we all know this. <laughs> if the adult has a Melbourne Party class four, yeah. like, which class would you recommend? Three and three or four. Yeah. ENT, not sleep study. Or well, we'll start with ENT, then. Yeah. Yeah. Adult sleep study, child, he knows the job. Straight, straight, okay. mm -hmm. These are not my guidelines, they're the Australian Sleep Association guidelines, mm -hmm. AESA. So if someone's, someone's got an hour pattern three or four, then they're not really well. No. Yeah. yeah. So see, you go home now, and you're going to start looking for check your partner. uvulas, <laughs> tonsils, check, check your partner, malus party. Who, who knows how to properly, this is the last question for the night, right? Like quizzing people, right? What's the proper way to test for a tongue type? A functional ankle glossary. Really Second half of Ruge, yes. Good. And then? And, and if they can't reach it, then you know, what is it? Mm -hmm. Alright, so the proper test, and this is by Dr. Uh, Audrey Yu, who's uh, published it in Sleep Terms. You get a patient open as wide as they can, right? Now, most opening would be 50 millimeters, right? And you measure that opening so that they can't check, right? Then you get them to put the tip of the tongue on the spot. Does everyone know the spot? It's basically second and third palatine group. Palatine, just behind palatine artery. So when they put their tongue there, right, then they open again until they release. Right? So watch me. I can open 50 millimeters uh, with a click. It's my horrible author. Um, you put a tongue here and then you open. Now I can open full 50 with my tongue there. So I absolutely am not tongue touch. If someone tongue releases, right, before 50% of their opening. Does that kind of make sense? That's functional ankylosia. That needs a referral. Yeah. Now the article is um, in Sleep Journal, and uh, Andrea, just write down. I'll send them the article on tongue tie. Just read the article. It's evidence based because so many people like have all this. Is it tongue tie? Is it not? You know, it's kind of like it's, it's like saying you know you can't be partially tongue tied Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like being partially pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. So with tongue tie, there's all this variation. I think speech bats probably, you know, get more confused because they think, you know, is it affecting this? So this is a really good classification. And it's good. So if you measure that as well, that could be a sign and symptom of the narrow palate. So David, thank you so much for